name is Elizabeth Barnes, and together with my colleagues, Robin Usborne from Michigan State University, Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University, and Amy Stone from Ohio State Extension, we run Emerald Ashbor University. Today, we are happy to share with you the presentation, Emerald Ashbor, Everything You Need to Know in Half an Hour. It will be presented to you by Cliff Sadoff and I. We will welcome your questions and comments today, so please feel free to type them in the chat pod or the Q&A pod. Cliff and I will answer them at the end of the session. Tomorrow, you'll be mailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will find the time to fill out because it helps us bring these webinars to you. The email will also contain information on how to obtain CEUs for viewing the live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Emerald Ashbor University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info webpage. Thank you for attending today, and now I'm going to hand it over to Cliff. In this presentation, I'm going to give you an update about Emerald Ashbor, the most serious exotic pest to ever attack uh, the North American forests. It's already killed billions of ash trees and it's likely to kill billions more. That said, uh, now that I've said that it's definitely an invasive species, uh, it is no longer regulated by USDA APHIS. Uh, APHIS has shifted its focus towards management with biological control, but they're still available to help states with their regulatory efforts so they can keep track of uh, the progress of the infestation. So today's focus is to uh, help you get the most protection value from uh, an application of emamectin benzoate uh, on a tree. So before I go much further, I think it's important to give a little background as to why uh, the quarantine on a federal level has been dropped. In this map, you see uh, every single red dot is a reported detection of emerald ash borer. Uh, that's usually the first report in each county. Uh, and <clears throat> you can see it's fairly widely distributed. So uh, this was the reason why they thought it's best to focus their efforts on management rather than spread, while still giving a hand to the states to the west uh, that have yet to get emerald ash borer. So one of the most common questions that I get is how often should I apply emamectin benzoate? Uh, and that's uh, because in the manual that we put together on <clears throat> providing pest management options for emerald ash borer, uh, we say quite emphatically uh, in the summary section that emamectin benzoate has consistently provided highly effective EAB control for two and even three years with a single application. Now, this was written intentionally so that we could give people flexibility to determine whether they need, they could uh, apply the product every two years or every three years. But, you know, we were somewhat vague on to the guidelines as to when you would want to go for two years and when you would want to go three years because that's a very difficult question to answer. This is what you need to know. First, consider your objectives. Are you trying to minimize the death of individual trees or trying to keep as much of your ash stand alive as possible? In other words, if you are uh, trying to keep every single tree that you treat alive, then you can have a very low tolerance for risk. But if you're trying to stretch your municipal dollars, you know, you have to ask yourself, does the benefit of treating a third more trees outweigh the cost of a few potential treatment failures? Uh, you also need to have a, to understand how the insecticides kill emerald ash borer. Both the adults and the larvae uh, need to be killed in order to get effective control with emamectin benzoate. Uh, in order to improve uh, the effectiveness of these applications and the extend the protection so you can get that three-year benefit, you got to remember that spring applications will give you much better uh, results than fall applications. Uh, you need to use enough injection ports to make sure you have an even distribution of product through the trunk and the canopy. And finally, you need to be aware of the local emerald ash borer status. 
your control practices have to be impeccable uh, because the uh, at the peak of the infestation because the control needs are highest when the untreated forest around you are is about half dead it's when you're sort of in the middle of the initial EAB death wave. After the death wave has passed, uh, the controls may last a little bit longer. <clears throat> so before I go further, I want to just review a little bit uh, about what the Emerald Ash Borer does. In this uh, photo that you see over here, uh, you see a progression of injury on a set of three trees that I found in a parking lot. Uh, the tree on the left has lost about 10 or 15% of its canopy, uh, and uh, it is a very good candidate for control with a mectin benzoate because that tree will more than likely be saved. Uh, when you start getting above 30% canopy loss, uh, that tree becomes uh, more uh, difficult to save. And uh, when you uh, have 50% uh, or more, you know, that tree really isn't worth saving because the dead part's not going to grow back. And if you imagine that tree uh, with the dead on the old far right with the uh, dead part missing, there's just not much of a tree left to save. And pictures like these and many others are available at the free uh, app that we have at, available at PurduePlantDoctor.com. Okay, so let's talk about how insecticides kill emerald ash borer while we review its life cycle. Right now, uh, it is uh, early May, and uh, towards the end of the month, when the black locusts begin to bloom, the adult beetles will start coming out of their of their uh, their trunks. Uh, and you can see on, the, on, on top of the label, it says May, you see these beetles uh, that are uh, coming out with these characteristic D-shaped exit holes because their backs are flat, their bellies are round. Then in May, uh, the uh, uh, beetles will uh, mate, uh, and then the female will feed on the leaves for a couple of, couple of weeks. And then uh, the, uh, uh, they, they will lay eggs. But you know, if you have poison in the leaves at that point in time, the uh, beetles will uh, die before they get a chance to lay eggs. So they, they usually feed you know, seven to 10 days before they start uh, laying eggs. Then the eggs are laid onto the trunk. Uh, they hatch, they bore into the uh, bark, and you have that characteristic planarian flat uh, larva that uh, produces uh, zigzag galleries, and then they winter under the bark until uh, April or May. But if you have insecticide in the trunk of, of the tree, if you eject the tree, uh, that these larvae will also be killed by uh, the insecticide. So it kills it in two ways. It kills uh, the adults that feed on the leaves, and it kills various stages of larvae that are feeding beneath the bark. And, you know, there are a number of insecticides that are out there. Uh, our focus is going to be the third insecticide on the list, uh, amamectin benzoate. And uh, none of these insecticides kill eggs. Uh, Emamectin benzoate kills all four stages of larvae, and it's highly toxic to adults that are feeding on leaves. And in all the situation, you got to remember that water carries the pesticides. So if you have a drought going on, you have to make sure these trees get enough water to move that product from the injection sites up into the canopy through the uh, vascular tissue, which is the source of, of the toxin for killing larvae that are beneath the trunk. So now, the strongest case for three years worth of protection comes from a six-year study uh, that was done by Deb McCulloch and her colleagues up in Michigan on uh, forest-grown green ash trees. Uh, they had it was highly replicated studies. Uh, trees were sub very substantial in size, between 21 and 31 inches in diameter. At breast height, uh, they compared a tefiran, imidacloprid, and emamectin uh, triage uh, in injection. Uh, and uh, what they did was uh, some of the trees, uh, they, was, they, they treated uh, triannually, which means once every three years, and other trees they treated annually, which meant every single year. Clearly, uh, and then what they did was they looked at, they peeled the bark and they counted the number of larvae that came out of uh, each uh, uh, section, and they estimated the number of larvae per meter. So, you know, upwards of 35 larvae per, 
per meter were found on uh, uh, trees that received no insecticide or dinotefrian once every three years. So clearly that's not enough to protect it, but if they uh, treated the trees annually with dinotefrian, uh, there were, weren't very many live larvae. Uh, imidacloprid had a bit of, which is the treatment on way on the right, had a, uh, a middling level of control, whether it was treated once every three years or, or annually. But what's really remarkable is whether you're using a high rate or a low rate of amamectin benzoate, five mils per inch or two mils per inch of DBH, uh, there's virtually no larvae. So this is the most definitive evidence for, for showing that you can keep larvae out of trees uh, if you treat them once every three years in this particular study. The first factor I want to address is the number of ports that are needed to be drilled into a tree trunk in order to get a decent product uptake and good control. The two most common systems, uh, Rainbow and uh, Arborjet that they produce, they both uh, uh, use uh, 16 port systems. Uh, that's because there are about 16 ports per meter of circumference at the DBH level uh, at, at, at breast height. And uh, there were some newer systems that were coming out, like this one here by the Brandt on Tree System that was claiming uh, equal success with half the number of, of holes being drilled. Anybody who's done this uh, knows if you cut your drilling time in half, uh, it would just greatly uh, speed up the process. So we did this work at Culver Academy in Northern Indiana, uh, where the average DBH of the trees uh, with the five replicates that we use for treatment was about 20 inches DBH. Uh, and we applied about five mils of 4% of amamectin benzoate uh, per inch of DBH, or about 0.2 grams AI per inch. And uh, as you can see on the graph on the right, we applied uh, the product in 2016, and the top line uh, is the control with the solid dot. Uh, there we see uh, that uh, it was about 18% canopy thinning on those trees over there, followed by a 50% canopy thinning in 2017, uh, progressing all the way up to 70% canopy thinning. Uh, the trees that were treated with the Entree system or the Q-Connect or the Tree IV system, they all were, were quite equally protected in both 2016 and 2017 as a result of a spring or June uh, application. Uh, in 2018, uh, the uh, Q-Connect and the Tree IV, this, which are the 16 port systems, uh, they also, they continue to provide excellent levels of, of control. And, uh, but the uh, Entree system with the eight ports uh, was starting to sort of uh, increase in the amount of canopy thinning, just uh, albeit a little bit and statistically insignificant. But by 2019, it really ran away uh, uh, as a result of the local pressure of emerald ash borer, but the uh, tree IV and the Q-Connect uh, hung in there. So we're seeing you know, almost in this situation, almost four years of, of protection uh, when we use that 16 port system as opposed to the eight port system. So why does this occur? Well, we measured the amount of uh, emamectin benzoate uh, that was taken up in the canopy uh, by collecting leaf samples a week and one month after we applied the insecticides. And we found that uh, both of the 16 port systems, the blue and the uh, purple uh, bars, uh, were uh, higher than the Entree EB uh, system, the port system about uh, in the first week. And, um, and in a month, the differences were quite dramatic. Uh, we started seeing, uh, you know, almost twice the amount of product in the canopy uh, on the 16 port systems compared to the uh, eight port system. And the reason for this is that there uh, were uh, virtually 98% of the leaves uh, that we uh, s collected uh, all had emamectin benzoate in the uh, 16 port systems. You know, So there's firstly maybe only one or two samples that had, had, had nothing in them, as opposed to the uh, eight port system, which only had about 60% of the leaves with toxin inside of them. So uh, when you have fewer ports, 
you have less uh, product in the canopy because you have fewer leaves with insecticides and that clearly is gonna have an impact on the control. The next factor we wanted to examine was how the local population of emerald ash borer affected the capacity to get two or three year treatment. And this was done uh, in a uh, place called Eagle Creek, uh, just outside of Indianapolis on some rather substantial large trees. And we conducted the study from 2013 through till 2020. So here's the results of this study. Uh, we applied the material in 2013 when the canopy thinning was uh, less than 10% in all three of the treatments. And one of the treatments were a group of 10 trees that had no insecticides. Another were a group of 10 trees that had were treated in the fall, which means uh, September or October. And another group of trees were treated only in the spring, uh, which meant June. And we can see that after this first treatment, the uh, uh, population pretty much remained the same between 2013 and 2014. Uh, but in 2015, there was a big jump in the number and the amount of canopy thinning that we were seeing in the, un, in the control trees. And we also saw an increase in the trees that were treated in the fall. So here's some pretty good evidence to suggest that the fall treatment at this point in time uh, only lasted uh, two seasons. Uh, but the, the material that were, trees that were applied in the spring, uh, we had uh, three years uh, worth of control. But by the time 2016 rolled around, uh, there was not much material left in the uh, trees to to protect them from the emerald ash borer uh, in either the fall or the uh, spring treated trees. Uh, but after we applied uh, the product, there was a, a decrease in the amount of canopy thinning uh, that was sustained through 17, 18, and 19, and it only just began to come up in 2020. So we had, you know, a f almost, uh, we had uh, three uh, or maybe even four seasons of, of, of control uh, as a result of that application. So the conclusion that we want to make is that the EAB population pressure is going to affect the protection. So you get two years of control you can't get too controlled during the death curve, especially if you are uh, applying it in the fall, uh, and you can get three years post death curve when the population is lower. Now we're assuming that we know a lot about the population, but we really didn't measure it. Uh, so I wanted to, sh to uh, show the results of a study on uh, the mortality of green ash trees and the number of emerald ash borer that emerged from those green ash trees that were done in uh, Pennsylvania, just to show you that uh, our assumptions of emerald ash borer population uh, do make some sense. So on the top line of this uh, table, you'll see the, the percentage of the dead green ashes that were observed. And you, know, you start out with a low level uh, in, uh, in their first year, followed by a jump to uh, 17 percent, uh, which jumps up really quickly to 56 percent, you know, pretty much uh, corresponding to what we're what we're seeing in the curve above. And then that goes up to 88 percent and then it sort of levels off as it approaches 100 percent. So the shape of the curve that could come out of this uh, Pennsylvania study is very similar to what we're seeing in how we're measuring uh, the decline of, of the ash trees. And uh, what I find really interesting is that the percentage of all the ash borers that can come out of these trees corresponds pretty closely to the uh, amount of canopy thing or the amount of the dead, dead trees that, that, that are there. So as the percent dead trees uh, increases, uh, the more and more of the beetles have emerged. And so uh, uh, when uh, the in, in the, the bump between 17% uh, uh, and 88%, we had a, a, a quite a few beetles come out. We went from 29% uh, of all the beetles to nearly 90% of all the beetles uh, coming out. So 60% of the beetles came out in those two years. So that's a lot of pressure. So, uh, you know, so our assumptions uh, about EAB population actually is uh, ver validated and, and, and verified. In summary, this is what you need to consider when choosing your treatment interval for emimectin benzoate. First of all, what is your objective? If you wanna minimize treatment failures, 
you're doing primarily residential stuff and uh, key trees, which are the focus part of the landscape or legacy trees, that puts you into the two-year column. Uh, if you are trying to maximize the number of trees saved and trying to stretch your dollars, uh, that would put you towards the three-year column. If you are in the middle of an EAB population uh, death curve, uh, when the ashes are seem to be melting all around you, that puts you into the two-year column. Uh, after the death curve, you could probably go towards the three-year column. If you are applying your, your MMectin benzoate weight in the fall, that puts you towards the two years. If you uh, wanted to go uh, treating in the spring, which is the recommended, then that puts you towards the three-year column. Uh, if you are working with an injection system that has less than the standard number of ports uh, as recommended by uh, Arborjet and Rainbow and, and the like, uh, then you will, at most, you're going to be getting uh, two years of protection. Uh, and uh, if you are using the standard, then you could move towards the three-year protection interval. So I hope this sums up and makes it easier for you to make a decision. Thank you, Cliff. We're going to switch gears now and talk about emerald ash borer host plant identification. Um, as I've mentioned in the uh, previous talks in this series, uh, this section was put together by Carrie Tauscher, but she is unable to record it and present it here. So um, I'm going to be presenting it instead. Today, we're going to talk about ash tree identification. As the name suggests, emerald ash borer feeds on ash trees. We will talk generally about um, ash identification first and then focus in more specifically on a few key ash species that you're likely to encounter. One of the easiest ways to sort of get a clue that you might be looking at ash trees is by looking at their leaves. Ashes have compound leaves, which means that they have a leaf that is made up of several leaflets. So all of this is a single leaf. One of the ways that I like to kind of figure out if something is a leaflet or a leaf, if I'm not sure, is I see where it easily breaks off. So if it easily breaks down here off of the branch, then that's probably where the leaf starts. Whereas if it easily breaks up here, then that would probably be where the leaf starts. Um, whereas if it sort of leaves a ragged tear, then there's a good chance that's a leaflet. Now, of course, this doesn't always work, but it's often a good starting point if you're unsure if something is a leaf or a leaflet. Uh, different ash species have different numbers of leaflets. Uh, and so this is really variable and not always a good tool to use for identification. Um, but just kind of as a general rule, they may have somewhere between four to seven or five to nine leaflets. One key way to distinguish between ashes and other trees is by looking at the end of the leaf. Um, some other trees that are lookalikes of ash have a pair of leaflets at the end, whereas ashes have a single terminal leaflet. Ash bark is also very distinctive. Ash trees tend to have smooth bark when they're young, but as the trees get bigger, they start to show a diamond pattern. Um, and I've always found it a little bit difficult to see myself, but once you train your eye, you can start to recognize this diamond. So here, right here, this is a good example of the diamond. You can see where it sort of splits open and then comes together. So the ridges split and then come together to form a diamond. Ash seeds are also very distinctive. They have this kind of paddle shape. Um, and the, the top of the paddle, so the thickest part has a foamy texture. The um, uh, seeds tend to show up in mid to late summer and they are clustered on the branches. They almost look like little like tassels or uh, really ragged pom-poms. Ash buds can be a good way to distinguish between different ash trees. Um, I'm showing the ash tree identification guide from the Nebraska Forest Service here. It's a really handy guide and I like how it shows um, these, these four ash tree buds uh, right side by side to give you a nice clean comparison. They are opposite branched arrangements. So there's a bud here and a bud here. 
they tend to be pointed, although as you can see, that's more distinct in some trees than others. Um, and uh, they often kind of have this almost like bishop's cap or Hershey's kiss shape. Um, and in some of them, it's even that sort of uh, dark brown color. So if you look at the green ash, the white ash, and the blue ash, it's that dark brown color that really makes it look like chocolate. White ash trees are very common in the landscape, or at least they were before emerald ash borer started coming through different areas. Um, I've chosen this picture with the caterpillar, uh, not just because I am a caterpillar person, um, but also because I think it really nicely shows one of the distinctive features of white ash, which is they have this glossy top, which has this um, a lovely green color. And then the bottom is a sort of soft, dusty, light green. Green ashes are at the upper end of the level of leaflets with seven to nine leaflets. Um, and these leaflets can be with or without teeth. And it's, it's very variable. Um, the younger trees have more lenticels and other ashes, um, and their bark is a lot rougher and bumpier than some of the other ashes that you will see. Blue ash bark, on the other hand, is much more flaky. Uh, even in this picture that I'm showing here of the blue ash, you can see some of that bark just peeling off of the tree. Uh, the they still again have that diamond fissure shape, but it's it's a little bit tricky to see. Um, as I said, the the diamond fissure is sometimes um, hard to notice when you're first working on identifying trees, but as you train your eye more and more, it'll become easier to recognize. As I'm sure many of you in the audience know. Uh, they also have the shortest wings on their seeds uh, compared to the other ash trees, and the buds are almost identical in color to the twigs. Now, uh, one of the last identifying traits is one that isn't always really obvious, but when you see it, it's very distinctive. Uh, so the, some of the branches have this almost square shape with these little uh, ridges of bark along it. Um, and you can see that really distinctly here. But again, it's one of those things where if you see it, it's a good chance that you have a blue ash. But if you can't find it, that doesn't necessarily mean that the tree you're looking at isn't a blue ash. Um, blue ash is also a little bit more resistant to emerald ash borer than some of the other trees that I've talked about today. Um, so it's often the one of the last types of ash in a landscape uh, while emerald ash borer is coming through. But that doesn't by any means uh, suggest that it's completely resistant to emerald ash borer. Now, whenever we talk about invasive species, we always bring up reporting. Um, and with emerald ash borer, reporting is a little bit less straightforward. And that's because it's so widespread at this point. If you live in an area that emerald ash borer has already gone through, it's less important that you report it if you see it. However, that data can still be useful to us because it can give us information about its distribution. If you live in an area that's kind of at either the border, recently um, invaded by emerald ash borer or not yet invaded by emerald ash borer, reporting is extremely important there because it lets us know how fast it's spreading and when it reaches new areas and whether we need to start um, doing things like protecting trees in those areas or not. In addition, if you come across an ash tree that's alive and healthy, even though all the other ash trees around it are dead, we want to know about that. You might have found a lingering ash. Lingering ash are trees that have some resistance to emerald ash borer, and we want to study those so that hopefully we can use that information to either breed them with other um, lingering ashes and develop a, uh, an ash tree that might be resistant to emerald ash borer, that um, maybe we can start having ash trees in our forests again in our, in our neighborhoods um, that, oh gosh, it would be wonderful if we got that. Um, so we really want to know if you find one of those. There are different ways that you can report invasive species. One of the first ways is the website EDMAPS, so that's E-D-D-MAPS.org. 
um, and its associated apps. Uh, the one for the Indiana region where we are is the Great Lakes EDN app, but there are others for different parts of the country and in up into Canada as well. These apps allow you to submit information about invasive species along with a photo that then is reviewed by experts. You can also email us or really anybody else who works on invasive species. We all talk to each other, so we'll eventually figure out the right person to get the information to. When you report it, there are a few things that are really useful for us to have. First off, we want to know where you are, uh, particularly if it's something that's in a tree that's kind of stationary, that'll allow us to go back and check out the area in the future. We also would love it if you can get a picture. Pictures help us to confirm whether what you saw was an invasive species or one of their lookalikes or if it's something that we can't quite tell and we need to follow up on in a different way. And lastly, if you can collect a sample, that's very useful to us. Uh, one great way to collect a sample is if you happen to have a water bottle with you, you can scoop up the insect in the water bottle, put the cap on, take it home, and throw it in the freezer. And that's a humane way to kill the insect as well. Um, and you just keep it there until somebody can send someone to pick it up. And with that, we will take any questions. We have on the screen our Invasive Species website, as well as our social media handles and our email addresses. All right, um, let me see what questions we have. Um, we have one question about the uh, continuing education credits. Um, we will send out an email about that and um, it will have all the details you need to know there. Uh, but the question is asking if you want to, you should follow up with me, uh, who is Elizabeth or Robin. And the answer is you should follow up with me. Um, all right, so we have a question here for Cliff. Uh, how old or big does a tree have to be before it can be treated? Could you repeat that again? How old does a tree have to be? How old or big does a tree have to be before it can be treated? Uh, okay. Uh, any tree, so any tree whose trunk is uh, as thick as your thumb, it can be attacked. Okay. So anything that is that is less than a half an inch in thickness will not be attacked, but anything larger than a half inch in thickness will be attacked. So if you want to protect it, you're going to have to treat it. All right. Um, okay, um, sorry, just reading the question. Uh, this one is asking, Chemical products were discussed a lot. Any updates on homeowner control recommendations, especially the soil drenches? Oh, yes. Well, the soil drenches, uh, well, whether you're using a dinotefuran or imidacloprid, uh, they can be quite effective on trees that are smaller. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you've got a, a tree, uh, if it's before May 15th, uh, you can get very good results if you apply uh, imidacloprid uh, to the base of your tree. So you would just you would just uh, pour it around the trunk of the tree uh, so that the uptake would come, go in there and that will make the leaves poisonous. It'll kill the adult beetles before they lay a lot of their eggs and it'll also kill the newly hatched larvae. Uh, the second uh, option is if you're a little bit late in the game, it's in June, uh, you can go in there with dinotefuran. And dinotefuran, you can, uh, uh, you can apply as a bark spray or you can apply as a, uh, as, a tr uh, as a soil trench. So those two products work kind of well. There are a number of products that are on the market uh, that have mixtures of clothianidin and mixtures of other uh, pyrethroids inside there, uh, and they will work fine as well. But remember, that works best only on trees if the trunk diameter, okay, is 
15 inches or smaller. And as you get towards 15 inches, your chances of success get smaller and smaller. So uh, just, to, just to emphasize, when I say a trunk diameter, if you're standing in front of your tree and you put your hand on the left side of the trunk and you put your hand on the right side of the trunk and your trunk diameter is 12 inches, that means your hands will be 12 inches apart. People get circumference and diameter confused an awful lot. All right, thank you, Cliff. Um, our next question is kind of a two-part question. Um, so uh, this viewer asks, how long do they stay in a stand? Do they move on or stay until the stand is dead, then move on? Once you start to treat, do you always have to treat for life? Okay, uh, interesting question. So in the slides that I was showing you, uh, that we, we, I talked about uh, that cycle at, at, at Eagle Creek, okay, you know, during the period of population explosion, you want to have as much, uh, you want to be, you don't want to miss any uh, insecticide applications. Okay, so if you're applying soil, you definitely want to be applying everything in the spring. Uh, you want definitely want to be applying your uh, 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 amamectin benzoate app applications in the spring. Um, and uh, that's when you're going to have your biggest pressure. After most of the untreated trees are dead, there just isn't enough food to support a population of emerald ash borers. So uh, that means that the population is going to go down drastically. It'll never go down to zero. So all those uh, uh, young saplings that are in the ditches or in places that aren't being managed, you know, they are going to be a source for emerald ash borer to come back. Uh, your treated trees, if you stop treating them for more than uh, the allotted time, so if you're treating them annually and you stop treating them annually, they will be susceptible. If you're, you're treating them once every three years and you stop treating them, they'll, they start becoming susceptible in year four. Uh, so, so you're going to probably have to uh, be on uh, a three or a four year schedule, you know, for uh, uh, pretty much uh, forever. Uh, the way to get the most out of a control uh, program would be if you if you're in a neighborhood uh, and you're in a, in a community, uh, I would recommend that you treat as many of your trees as possible in one time, because what that does is that lowers the overall population of beetles in the area, so that you're not feeding, uh, you're not raising the population by leaving untreated trees in your urban forest, and that that way you'll you'll be your control would last longer. Uh, one of the things that you, so, you know, and the interval at which you treat is really going to depend on your tolerance for injury. So if, you know, one of the nice things about the emamectin benzoate treatments is that they're very lethal to all stages of larvae. So if you wait, you know, I've actually done this uh, in uh, at a, at a few sites where I've, you know, where I've just been uh, randomly injecting trees. Uh, I waited four years in between injections. And what happened was I noticed that there was some woodpecker injury in year four, but uh, that limb, which had the woodpecker injury, you know, died, but the rest of the tree was fine. So you could stretch it a little bit further. But, you know, once you get beyond three years, you know, you may be uh, uh, starting to have some, some losses. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, our next question is does EB affect just EAB or does it impact native insects that feed on ash? Uh, well, yes, it, 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 it acts. So emamectin benzoate will kill caterpillars that feed on ash trees. It'll kill uh, ash bark beetles. It'll kill redheaded ash borers. It'll kill, uh, it won't kill scale insects. It won't kill uh, ash, leaf ash curl aphids. Uh, but it kills uh, all the uh, chewing insects. Now, that said, uh, if the ash trees all die, there's nothing for the native specialists to feed on. So if you want to think about preserving a species, uh, you're probably better off uh, having your tree uh, uh, alive so that it could, it could survive. Now, let me just back up a little bit. 
one of the things that we've noticed with gypsy moth work is that uh, an injection of emamectin benzoate will kill gypsy moth reliably for one year. There may be some mortality, but not much mortality in the second year of the gypsy moth. And by year three, there's no effect at all. So if you're on a three year interval treating your ash trees, that means once every three years, your trees will be poisonous to the caterpillars and to the native butterflies uh, that, that are feeding on them. And then the other two years, it won't. It's not a perfect solution but at least uh, two out of three years, they'll have something to feed on. Our next question is, I believe at the beginning, he mentioned EAB is no longer managed by USDA APHIS. I did not catch the reason why. Was it because we just have to accept them as here and established? The, okay, so the, the reasoning is that uh, since it was detected in 2003, uh, it was detected in 2002, uh, that is almost 20 years, all right? And it's been expanding. So rather than, and, and money is limited. So rather than focusing on limiting the spread only, uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to help us with, uh, with managing uh, the uh, emerald ash borer, and their focus is on the biological control. Okay, so my focus, the focus of my talk, was on using chemicals to protect trees and cities, whereas APHIS is involved in the release of parasite, parasitic wasps that come from Asia that are effective at killing the emerald ash borer and allowing the trees to grow at least to pole sized lumber before they're killed by the emerald ash borer. So what that does is it pre preserves its ecosystem function by uh, uh, allowing them to grow to be substantial so they can be in our waterways, filter the water, uh, they can produce uh, seeds that feed wildlife and a lot of the herbivores that feed on these things. So, so the idea was that rather than, than uh, use their limited dollars for containing the spread, which has not, uh, since it's pretty much spread throughout most of the Eastern North America at this point in time, uh, they're not going to, they're, they're de-emphasizing that. Now, that said, they're not leaving the Western states high and dry that have got uh, ash trees. Those Western states need, uh, need some help. So what they, they are around to help support uh, state regulatory act activities uh, for uh, uh, interstate uh, transport, but that's not gonna be their primary purpose. So it's not an abandonment of the ash trees. It's just more of a shift in focus from uh, the vast majority of their effort being into containment to having the majority of their effort being towards biological control. That said, uh, uh, earlier this semester, uh, and if you go back, uh, I think it was in March, I believe, uh, we had uh, two people from APHIS talking about the change in their policy. Uh, one person was talking about how uh, 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 the rationale for the change in this and what that meant from a regulatory standpoint. And the other second person uh, talked about uh, the, um, uh, the biological control efforts and what to expect expect from that. So all those questions can be answered in, in a lot of details if you just go back to that webinar. Uh, I hope that helps. Uh, the next question is, will EAB migrate to other species of trees? Uh, well, I think they can migrate onto all kinds of trees. It doesn't mean they're going to live there. So they can fly anywhere, but, but, but the only thing that they, that they feed on in North America that we know of in addition to uh, that's in the, the olive family, which is where the uh, ash trees are, uh, are is in the white fringe tree. Uh, so they will they will do well on white fringe trees, but not quite as well as they do on ash trees. So yes, we can have some uh, movement there, but uh, lilac trees are not at risk. Lilac shrubs are not at risk. So, uh, so for the most part, uh, you know, the, the main food on its menu is ash trees. 
So I think that actually answers the next question as well, uh, which is, is there any evidence of EAB moving on to alternative hosts, i.e. non-ASH, when population pressure is present in an area? Um, but if that didn't answer that question, please uh, follow up in the chat with a follow-up question. Um, yeah, no, yeah, without ash trees, uh, the vast majority of them are going to die. Um, so our next question is, do you think chemical intervention has a role to play in outbreak strategies of con for control of EAB in areas of the U.S. that are free from it? Of course. <laughs> I just gave you a talk about how to use chemical control to protect your city trees. You know, there have been quite a few economic analyses that shows that dollars spent on ash management uh, have a higher cost benefit ratio than dollars spent on just replacing the ash trees in the urban forest. So in the urban area, it makes sense. Uh, it has made sense, you know, uh, for dec for almost uh, almost eight or nine years now that we have this uh, this emmectin benzoate product that works. Uh, you know, and the more that, you know, the more that you can uh, follow the guidelines of applying the product in the spring, uh, uh, the and uh, starting early before there's a substantial damage to the vascular system of the ash trees, the better of an effect you're going to have, the better effectors you're going to have with that product uh, on a three-year schedule. So I, I think the question may have been getting at areas that haven't had uh, reports of EAB yet. So I think they're wondering oh. if it can be used sort of preemptively to protect trees from emerald ash borer. These insecticides do not have a repellent effect. Okay, so if they're not anywhere near your trees, you're just wasting your money. I mean, I'm, I'm just don't mean to be rude, but I want to be blunt to get the point across. Um, and there's somebody who's asking for the watch link, which um, that will be uh, sent out in an email. Um, and it will be up on YouTube. Usually we have that up within a day or two. Uh, and I don't see any other questions right now. So I will start wrapping up, but if you have another question, please feel free to either put that in the chat right now, or if you think of something later, uh, that the email that I mentioned before will also contain contact information for me, Cliff and Carrie. So you can send us other questions that you have after the fact. Uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, on Emerald Ashborough University. We have, uh, I believe, oh, hand raised, maybe not. Okay, we have uh, a few more uh, webinars in this uh, Everything You Need to Know in Half an Hour series. Tomorrow we will be presenting Asian Longhorn Beetle. And then next week we will also have Thousand Cankers Disease and Hemlock Willia Delgid. We hope that you can join us for that. If you are uh, wondering how you can get continuing education credits, those will, uh, that information will be shared to you in an email that will be sent out shortly. That email will also contain a link to a short confidential survey that we hope you will fill out. Your answers help shape the future of this webinar series as well as um, help us continue to bring them to you. Uh, and with that, I don't see any more questions. So I'm going to end the session. Thank you for everyone who joined us and thank you for, to Cliff for presenting a great talk. Bye everyone. Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye-bye.